Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of the Vietnam War. I'm Mike B and today, after a long time of having not made a video in the series and having a lot of people request I do that, I'm going to come back with a really cool topic and also a very popular topic that's been requested many times and discussed and is debated by collectors and historians alike and etc etc. That's going to be the use of tiger stripe camouflage during the Vietnam War. Um, like I said, there's a lot of controversy, there's a lot of debate about the specific kind of patterns that were used, what colors, what cuts of uniform, who used them, who were authorized to wear them, and whatnot. Um, it's, there's a lot of reproductions that are passed off as real, you know, tiger stripe pattern uniforms that were used during the Vietnam War. And it's hard to tell the difference in the fakes and stuff. So it's a, it's a minefield when you get into this. And for some reason, this pattern is insanely popular even till to this to this day. Um, I don't know why it's not, I think, one of the best camouflage patterns I've ever seen. It looks neat, it's got a cool name, and it was in, you know, John Wayne wore it in the Green Berets in that movie, which made this really a popular pattern. Um, and a lot of guys that were wearing this in Vietnam, from what I hear, first-hand accounts, they liked it. They said it worked, but, you know, your alternative was an olive drab solid color uniform. So, I mean, I guess some sort of camouflage um uh, break of your outline might be better than nothing who knows but anyway i'm just going to kind of go over the history of the uniform itself the pattern itself um it's not going to be too detailed but i'm just going to lay some misconceptions or not lay them to rest but set them straight rather uh, because there's a lot of misconceptions around anything popular is going to have a lot of misconceptions surrounding it so i'm going to list a couple of those and we'll we'll try to go over those in this video so basically, the story starts in the 1950s when the French were in what was then Indochina. It wasn't Vietnam at that point. It was still a French colony, and they, uh, the Viet Minh and the Vietnamese people were trying to fight for their independence because they didn't want to be a French colony anymore. So they ended up winning in 1954, and then French troops started withdrawing, and that was that. Now, the French troops were wearing their famed um, lizard pattern, which was like a... Uh, pattern that came out in 1947-ish and that their airborne forces and elite forces were wearing that kind of looked like a variation of tiger stripe. If you've ever seen it, um, you can Google a picture of it. Just look up French lizard camouflage. And so after, after the French left, Vietnamese special forces and some of the Vietnamese um, rangers and Marine Corps started using a variant and they started experimenting with their own kind of um, patterns based what we think uh, is on the French um, model 1947 tiger or uh, lizard pattern. See how it gets convoluted already because there's no proof that that is the case, but that's what was said and that was is what would make sense uh, where they got the inspiration for the vertical stripes basically. And uh, this pattern, this particular tiger stripe pattern and the ones that were subsequently used, uh, a lot of variations of Vietnam, are, they consist of 60, 64 stripes in um, a vertical fashion. Uh, there are, you know, hor I'm sorry, a horizontal fashion. There are vertical variants, but in Vietnam, you're mainly going to see this horizontal variant like I'm wearing right now. And then in the early 1960s, 1962-ish, um, a little bit earlier, when the United States began sending advisors to Vietnam to, you know, because they were kind of having a civil war after the French left versus the um, non-communist South and the communist North. And so the U.S. was sending advisors to help the South Vietnamese, or ARVN, Army of the Republic of Vietnam, and all of their subsidiary groups, uh, kind of teaching them how to fight and supplying them with weapons against the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong at that point. So they saw that the um, Arvin Rangers and Marines were actually wearing some tiger stripe stuff and it worked a little bit better than what they were wearing. They were wearing the, you know, the sateen olive green um, uniforms and then later on the first pattern jungle fatigues which were also a solid green. And they started asking if they could get their own tiger stripe sets made. Now, South Vietnamese people and sizes back then, they were a lot smaller and differently shaped than Americans. So the uh, local tailors were the ones that started making these uniforms for the Americans. And they had to make them bigger and all that stuff. And the cut was a little bit, it was still really kind of thin and made for a very thin person. But uh, nevertheless, uh, people started wearing them. They were not technically ever issued by America at all. They were... Um, it was, it was never an official United States pattern, let's put it that way. But it was authorized for wear by advisors in certain groups, like later on, uh, Special Forces, uh, Fifth Special Forces Group, and Marine Corps advisors and all that stuff began to be authorized to wear them with U.S. insignia on them. So you're going to see the name tapes, awards, um, patches, unit patches, all that stuff, just like any other uniform. But you're going to see this. However, 
None of these were actually produced and made by the United States military and issued out by the U.S. military. That is a misconception. On my video that I made of opening up an uh, original box of Jungle Fatigues, right, the olive green ones, uh, people were like, oh, can you imagine finding a box of these tiger stripes? It was never like that. So that's the thing. They were, they were always made on a um, personal basis. So a person, a soldier would go in and use their uniform allowance or just their money to get one or two sets made, custom sized to them. And there were a lot of makers. I can't, I don't have the information on the actual um, manufacturers because so many of them were just private, but they were, they were uh, made in different countries as well because it became really popular. It's lucrative. Every, you know, wartime, you can actually make some money if your country's affected by making stuff like this. So uh, Thailand, Korea, Japan, and uh, well, specifically more in Okinawa where a lot of U.S. forces were. A lot of these people in these shops started making these things to, to sell commercially to these special operations soldiers. So, um, yeah, like the Green Berets, again, uh, advisors and stuff were going to be non-conventional troops, basically, were the ones that you're going to be seeing wearing these. Now, when Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol LERP units started coming out, uh, when we got more involved in like about 1965 and 66, that became a thing. They also would be authorized to wear these um, camouflage uniforms that were privately purchased with U.S. insignia if they so chose. Which a lot of times they rolled with slick sleeves. They didn't roll with anything because if they were captured, they didn't want people to, the enemy to know what unit was where. So you're going to see a lot of people that were operating with tiger stripes in Vietnam, LERP units, um, special forces. Some of those guys wore insignia. Marines and stuff like that that were going to be you know, rangers, non-conventional troops that were going to be having wearing sanitized tiger stripe uniforms for that reason. Now, the... With regards to the topic of how many different patterns were used, how many different colors, there are there are books literally written, and I'm actually thinking about getting one of these as a reference, uh, just about the the variation and the amount, the sheer amount of colors, uh, sh shapes, I guess, different patterns. Um, there's at least seven known that are widely accepted, and that's like you know tadpole, sparse. Um, golden tiger stripe. That's another variation. That's really weird. Um, this would just be your um, what the heck is this called? Then there's a John Wayne one. There's a bunch of different variants. All of these can be seen being worn in Vietnam by Arvin troops, U.S. military personnel, and some other um, troops like Australian troops were wearing them as well. Unconventional troops like that. So it's really interesting. It's a really interesting topic. Now again. They were never issued by the United States. They were all private purchased. However, they could wear U.S. insignia on there. Um, by the time ERDL or ERDL comes out in 1967 and 68, a lot of these non-conventional units started using that instead of these because they were actually issued by the United States. They didn't have to buy them. Although the Tiger Stripe was very well liked by um, non-conventional forces. Also, the SEALs at that time became a thing and the SEALs would wear these. And then they went to ERDLs and stuff like that. So at, towards the end of the war, from about 68 onward, you're going to see a mix of unconventional troops wearing literally a tiger stripe top with ERDL pants or vice versa. Or you're going to see them wearing, you know, four people in a team, whatever. One of them is wearing tiger stripe. One of them is wearing ERDL. One of them is wearing a mix. It's, it's insane how many different variations um, and combinations of uniform were worn after 1967 and 68 by non-conventional troops. So... These eventually started being, you know, not really phased out. But after the Vietnam War, tiger stripes were not authorized for U.S. wear at all. Jungle fatigues were because they were an issued uniform. These, however, were not. This was never officially adopted as a pattern because of the ERDL situation going on that had been in production since the early 60s and kind of, you know, trying to figure that out. And then they started issuing that in 67. And then after ERDL, you know, you've got, you go know, back to the solid olive green when we got out of Vietnam. And then you've got Woodland BDU in 1981. So, yeah, it's it's a short-lived uniform, but its impact is still widespread to this day. There were so many patterns that are still being used today that are designed off of this tiger stripe, this overall. Tiger stripe, when I say it, is a family of camouflage. It's kind of like flectarn. There's there's German woodland flectarn, and then there's Tibetan, you know, Chinese-Tibetan mountain flectarn. It's a similar pattern, although different and used by different countries. So this is a family of camouflage. And as far as being worn in Vietnam, it was very effective, apparently. It was highly liked by unconventional troops, and it was pretty widely used by them. So a lot of these were produced. Finding original examples is very difficult because, A, again, like I said, a lot of people pass off reproductions like I'm wearing as originals, and they'll put patches on there, and they'll age it a little bit. 
And unfortunately, it's really hard to tell originals from fakes or reproductions just because of the amount of variations and the, I mean, literally what I'm wearing right now, I could pass this off as being a unissued or unworn original because it is so good. And there, you know, it falls into the criteria of, okay, we've seen original pictures of this, but um, there are ways to tell, but it's really difficult. So it's, it's a minefield. And it's just, if you do find them, they were so few and far between. You know, for every thousand conventional troops, there's one unconventional troop that's going to be wearing this. So to put that into perspective of uniforms, it's going to be very difficult to find an original tiger stripe uniform. I have, and they're about a thousand dollars for just the, the blouse itself. And they're usually going to be in a small size. And if they're in good shape, they're going to be more. I have seen them as low as 500, but they're in ratty shape or they're really fishy looking. So... I hope this kind of illuminates and explains a little bit the use of Tiger Stripe in the Vietnam War, as it were. And it was one of the cool, it was, I think it was the most widely used, uh, the first most widely used um, camouflage pattern that was used by the U.S. military. I know we used uh, the frog skin in World War II a lot, but that wasn't until the later war. And by the time that got issued in wide numbers, or large numbers, it was... You know, just mainly the Marines and Navy personnel in the South Pacific. And so in Vietnam, this was one of the first widely used adopted camouflage patterns, even though it was unofficial, that was worn, which is probably also why it gives it that iconic kind of flavor. And it just looks cool. So I'll be trying to do a camouflage test and I'll do, I'll try to get a couple more variations that are a reproduction to kind of show you a comparison video. But for now, I just wanted to break the ice on the subject of tiger stripe pattern uniforms in the Vietnam War. Unofficial U.S. pattern. Authorized for wear to certain troops and they could wear insignia if they so chose other than that You're not going to see a lot of conventional troops wearing this stuff All right, that's all I've got if you like this video and found it useful and you like this series Like I know a lot of you have been bothering me to make more videos You can actually support my work and keep this going and allow me to get cool things like this to teach you guys about history These are expensive. This is about a hundred bucks just for a reproduction But it's worth it and then I'll be able to do a camouflage test with it and then talk about what was worn with these, with unconventional troops, etc., etc. But um, crowdfunding actually does really help that, and you can do that two ways. You can either become a Patreon supporter, with the link to that is in the description, or you can become a channel member. The button is right below, and it should say join right down there, if I pointed at that correctly. Uh, five bucks a month or more on either platform gets into my Discord server, which is a really cool place. A lot of information is exchanged. There's a lot of people on there. And your support just helps me be able to, again, afford things that I wouldn't otherwise be able to afford out of pocket. It allows me to make more content using visual aids as a historical reference. Because, I mean, you can just sit there and look at pictures. But it's kind of cool to see somebody actually wearing this and kind of see how it would be in color. So that really does help. You can also, uh, there's a, sh a link to my merch shop in the description if you don't want to become a you know, monthly supporter. You just want to get a t-shirt or something with the uh, Mike Guevara. That's the first, you know, the classic revolutionary design that we've got so far. But um, after me making this video, I'll probably have more designs in the future. So if you're watching this in the future and I have more designs, by all means. Right now, I only have one, but it's pretty popular. Anyway, those are all ways you can support my work. And uh, let me know if you've got any other ideas that you want to see me do and cover for the Vietnam War. I'm planning on doing this in the Korean War. And I may, I'm going to keep going with the First World War. And I may start a Second World War series, too. That's in the works. So... Anyway, I know this video was rambly, but Tiger Stripes is a very vast kind of pocket of knowledge that I'm just giving you a brief overview and it took this long. So imagine that. So I'm going to learn more about it and then I'll present more to you. So anyway, thank you for watching, everybody. I appreciate it. If you made it this far, comment with nice Tiger Stripe. <laughs> anyway, thank you for watching, everybody. And we'll see you on the next episode of the Vietnam War.